through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee for thy plan of redemption, and for the Lord Jesus Christ, whose coming made the basis for a new creation, and whose life in its pouring out gives us life. May we discern this day the wonderful reality of the cross, and come into the realization of some of the infinite number of things that thou art able to do for us, because the Lord Jesus died on Calvary. Speak to every heart, we pray thee, in the name of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The true understanding of the Bible consists in a true understanding of the meaning of its main words. No one can claim to know anything about the Bible if he is not thoroughly conversant with the meaning of such words as sin, salvation, justification, sanctification, redemption, imputation, the new birth, inspiration, and similar terms that are the links in the chain that holds the whole of Scripture together. But in addition to these great words, there are some shorter words that might seem insignificant to the casual reader, but which take on tremendous importance as we go deeper into the meaning of the revelation which God has given us. In our study of the Epistle to the Romans, we have arrived at a point where two little words separate all that has gone before from all that has come after. The two little words are, but now, but now. A careful study of the epistles of Paul show that in his mind all time was divided into then and now. Then was everything that had happened before Christ died. Now is everything that is contingent upon the death of the Savior. Then we were dead in sins. Now we are alive forevermore. Then we were under the law, slain. Now we are raised from the dead by the gospel. God has given to us a wonderful symbol of this complete change by ordering our lives so that most of us pass through the stages of meeting someone we admire falling in love with them, wooing or being wooed, marrying and establishing a home. People who are happily married will understand me perfectly when I say that life quickly takes on a new pattern with marriage, and the married ones little by little forget the things that happened in life in the single days. Those days recede into the years until people who have been married for four or five years and sometimes for only a few months may say, I can hardly remember when I wasn't married. Life took on a new pattern, and the old pattern simply faded away. Then, life was in preparation. But now, life is mature and complete. Then and now. Life has such changing and transforming episodes. And when we understand this, we can understand a little more of the meaning of the Bible teaching, that marriage is a symbol of the union of the believer with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can understand that a divorce is not only a misfortune and a sin, but is, in a spiritual sense, a blasphemy. So for Paul, all time was divided into then and now. First for himself in his own personal experience on the road to Damascus, and then, theologically, into the period before Christ had made the joy of salvation possible, and the time since the cross of Calvary had brought all of the plan of God into present focus. For himself, of course, it was the Damascus road that made him see all of life in a new light. There the scales dropped from his spiritual eyes, and he saw clearly the truth of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. There the light of heaven came through to his heart, his mind, and his conscience so that the old prejudices dropped away, and he saw the truth of God in its eternal and universal aspects. Like the blind man who was healed by Jesus in the temple, he could cry, One thing I know, that whereas once I was blind, now I see. But here, at our text in Romans 3, Paul speaks of the change not so much in the sense in which it affected him personally, as in the sense in which such a transformation was made possible for all men. Christ had died, and a new dispensation had been brought in. Now that I have used the word dispensation, let me digress for a moment 
to bring some teaching that is greatly needed in our day. The word dispensation is in the Bible as the translation of the Greek word oikonomia, from which our English word economy is derived. It is a word that is made up of the Greek words for house and law. In the ears of the Greeks, the word must have sounded something like the word house law would sound in our ears. It had to do with the method of governing and administering the affairs of a household. In the New Testament, the word is used for God's methods of administering his plans, for governing those that are of the household of faith. And its usage shows that God has administered his plans differently at one time and another. In late years, the word has been seized upon by some to nullify certain truths that are in the scriptures, some maintaining that in this age there is not to be any water baptism of any kind because such things were for another dispensation or age. Some even claim that there's to be no communion service for this age. Now such error has rightly been branded as heretical, and we are the first to join with those who attack such dispensationalism. But we must not abandon the truth that there have been different dispensations of God's dealing with his household simply because some people have taken the word and twisted it to cancel out some truths. Every Christian is, of course, a dispensationalist in one sense. If you do not have a lamb killed for the remission of your sins, as did Moses and David, you are, of course, recognizing that the dispensation of God's dealings changed when the New Testament was brought in. If you keep the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, the day of the resurrection of Christ, instead of the seventh day, the Jewish Sabbath, the day of death, when the body of our Lord was in the tomb, you are recognizing that God changed his methods of dealing with his people. If you recognize that the gospel of Jesus Christ is open and available to all men, instead of merely to the members of one race, then you are recognizing the principle that there was a drastic change made at the time when our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead. But in recognizing these changes, we must never fall into the error of believing that man was ever saved in any other way than that which is set forth through Christ. Moses was saved by looking forward to Christ, just as we are saved in looking backward to Christ. We are quite in accord with those who condemn the idea that there is any method of salvation apart from faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The men of the Old Testament were saved by believing God's word about the substitutionary sacrifice which was slain on the altar. It was a picture of the death of Christ, the Savior, and God counted their faith, no matter how uninformed it might have been, instead of the righteousness which they did not have in themselves. And down in the future to the end of time, God will save men still on the same basis of faith in the grace that was manifested when Christ gave his life for us on the cross. So we reach the ridge that divides the two valleys, and Paul says, but now, but now, and these words take us from the era of law to the era of grace. In understanding this change, we comprehend the nature of the law and the nature of the gospel. Newell has an excellent paragraph on this subject. After showing that it is more difficult to dislodge legalists from the law than it is the heathen from their ceremonies, he writes, In just the same way Christendom has become fixed in its defense of its religious convictions. Scripture names, doctrines, and ordinances falsely explained have seized hold upon the convictions of men so that it is more difficult to dislodge them from their position than it is to dislodge the heathen themselves. We know from scripture, for example, that days, seasons, months, and years do not belong to the Christian position in the least degree, but are pagan in origin or else are derived from the ancient law. Christmas, Lent, Easter, the whole church calendar, forms, ritual, the confessional, the mass, clergy, where are these found 
in the epistles of the New Testament. They are not found. Yet try once to dislodge them from those in whose hearts they have been planted, for their heart hopes are bound up with these false traditions. None but those taught of God, and they with extreme difficulty and constant watchfulness escape legal hope. For the question ever before the conscience is, if keeping God's law avails nothing for righteousness in his sight, why did he give it? Why did he give it? And this difficulty becomes all the greater, the more the excellency of the law is discovered. For our judgment sees these things of the law to be holy, righteous, and good. And we know, if we are honest, that God spake all these words of the law. Therefore, the heart's only relief is to hear God's own word concerning seven questions, to all of which the coming chapters of Romans will give answer. One, to what nation did he give the law? Two, why did he give the law? Three, what was the law's ministry? Four, how was the law set aside or annulled for another principle entirely? Five, what is meant by the words under grace? Six, how does the walk in the spirit take the place of walking by the law, by external enactment? And seven, how is it that only those not under the law are in the righteous state, and in them only is the law fulfilled? Now it is apparent that to bring men away from their false hopes in their law obedience, three things must become evident to them. One, that law, having been broken, can only condemn. Two, that even were men enabled now to begin keeping perfectly the law of God, that could not make up for their past disobedience or remove present guilt. And three, that keeping law is not God's way of salvation or of blessing. Now we come to the section beginning with but now, and we are to find the righteousness of God manifested in Christ. What could not be produced by man is here seen as provided for man. What could not arise from Moses can flow freely from Christ. I had begun to mark my Bible when I was in my teens. Over the paragraph which we are now about to study, I had drawn a heart, and in my notes I said that this passage was not only the heart of Romans, but the heart of the New Testament and the heart of the whole Bible. I am more convinced today that these verses are indeed the most important in the whole Bible. Understand them, and you will understand the whole Bible. Fail to comprehend their true meaning? and you will be in darkness concerning most of Scripture. For here is the revelation of the being of God and the nature of his being. Here is the revelation of sin and of the depths of sin. Here is the revelation of God's righteousness and the infinite demands and provision of that righteousness. Here is one of the keys of human history and the explanation of much that happened before the time of Christ as well as the revelation of the principles that were to prevail in God's dealings with men since Christ. Here the mouths of those that would slander God because of his free pardon of sinners are closed forever. Here is the vindication of the nature and character of God, righteous in all that he does. But now God's righteousness hath been disclosed apart from the law. Back in the first chapter, we studied at some length the revelation that the gospel was the setting forth of the righteousness of God. That which was announced there is declared here in more detail. Why is it called the righteousness of God? There might be several answers to this question, and since all of them are true, they are probably all parts of the complete answer, which we will never know fully until we have been made like him. The righteousness of God is specifically his because of the nature of his being. He is the one who is righteousness in himself. But it is also his righteousness 
because he must demand it of us. The righteousness which he is must be the righteousness with which he surrounds himself. Therefore he must demand of us a righteousness equal to his own. However, since none of us can produce this righteousness, it is proper to call it the righteousness of God because it is also the righteousness which he provides freely for us. The theme of the epistle to the Romans is the righteousness of God. It is God as the center of righteousness. It is God as the source of righteousness. It is God as the stream of righteousness outflowing. God is righteousness. God demands righteousness. And God provides righteousness. If those three statements are understood, then the whole gospel will be understood. If those three statements are not understood, then the gospel can never be understood. Wherever there is heresy, men have departed from the idea that God is righteousness, and therefore he must demand that righteousness of all, since none can have it apart from him, because his nature is also love. He provides his righteousness in his own way. I believe that it would be possible to group all heresies under three headings and list them for their departure from one of those three truths. A departure from the first, that God is all righteousness. Men have departed by believing that because God is love, his righteousness will take a place second to some other part of his being, and that therefore there can be no eternal punishment, no final dealing with sin. Under this head, are all of the heresies also which bring distortions of the idea of God, those that are to be found in the midst of the heathen world. Now, from the second proof that God must demand righteousness of all his creation, men have departed by believing that surely God will let men get by his judgment on some lower scale, such as human good works. All the heresies that proclaim men can reach heaven without the sacrifice of Christ must be grouped under this heading. The heresies of salvation by character. The heresies of salvation through rites and ceremonies. Through church membership, ordinances or sacraments. All these are departures from the idea that God must demand a righteousness equal to his own. And finally, from the fact that God has provided perfect righteousness that is now available to every man through Jesus Christ, men have departed by believing that Jesus was merely a man and that therefore incapable of providing a substitutionary atonement for all sinners, while others have also departed from this truth in another direction by believing that although Christ is God, salvation and righteousness are provided partly by the Savior and partly by the cooperation of the individual in furnishing some good works to make up that which Christ has started. But true Christianity is the unswerving avoidance of any of these pitfalls. The word of God leads us in a straight road and will keep us from any of these side paths which lead into the swamps of false thinking and ultimately lead to judgment and the lake of fire. God is righteous. He is indeed all righteous and righteousness. God must demand righteousness because the very nature of his being requires him to require of all that which he is in himself. Now, since no individual can ever provide that which God demands, God in his love has provided it equally for all. Finally, our text states that this righteousness of God is manifested. Now, what does the word manifest mean? When we realize that the word manifest comes from the Latin word for hand, menus, and the verb for strike, we can comprehend that a thing is manifest when it is as plain as a hand that comes to strike you. Now, today, if the gospel is manifest, it means that the hand of God holds out the righteousness of God for you to see. And if you say that you do not see anything in his hand, I ask you to look at the hand itself. 
For you will see that the hand has the print of a nail, and that the hand was pierced, and that you may, by faith, put out your hand and touch that wound. And when you do, you will know that there is the evidence, the manifestation of the righteousness of God. Manifestation, God makes it as plain as a striking hand. Today is the day of grace. The hand will not strike you in judgment because it was itself struck in judgment for you. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Will you reach out by faith in this hour and say to your Creator, O God, as best I know, in all the weakness and sinfulness of my fallen nature, I reach out to that hand that was wounded for me, and as best I know, I stop trusting in anything which has its source or its spring in me, and I build my hope on the Lord Jesus Christ and in him alone. If you will do that in this hour, he will come and manifest his love within your heart, and you will know that on his own evidence, his righteousness has been put to your account. Come while it is yet now, before it becomes another then. And we pray thee in this moment, our God and Father, that thou wilt take this truth to many hearts. May there be those who will look to thee to say, As best I know, I believe thy word about my sin, and I believe thy word about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, to provide thy righteousness for me. And these things we ask in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.